Dear Christian, we discussed doing a project together, long distance, and now that you're back home, I'm sending you some photographs. I take pictures of the ground and variations on that theme. I've attached a few to see if this begins something between us. All of my pictures are about Los Angeles and about my relationship with the city. You will see one photo that pictures a Guyton and Walker catalog. Last New Year's Eve, I took the catalog on a road trip and photographed it for a series I did for my blog, Notes on Looking. Most of these photographs are relatively anonymous with your places, and some, while being anonymous, are related to my own experiences. I have begun to name these pictures for the place that I am visiting or walking, but for the most part I leave them unnamed. And I'm kind of laughing at myself, because they are all related to moments of uncertainty. I appreciate their blankness, and I love the specificity of each image. Age, time, details, weather, history, emotion, all these things are present if hidden in plain sight. The ground is great. I hope to hear back from you soon, Christian. Bye. Dear Geoff, thank you so much for these images. I really love them. For me they work like a mapping of the city in a way, but they seem to be a very personal thing for you too, like the relation to the city in which you grew up and the past moments that you spend at these exact same spots, I guess. So the interest in layers of time and history seems to be something that we both share, and it would be interesting to go a bit deeper into that topic together. But there was one thing that I didn't really get. It's the thing with the catalog. Can you explain a bit more about the idea behind this? Like what is the relation of the catalog to the ground for you? I hope to hear from you soon and all the best. Dear Christian, once again, the catalog came in over, the, over a series of posts on my blog. In the post, the ground began to play something of a role. It was a way of placing myself and the reader, too. In one post, I place the catalog on the ground, and it becomes a character, and almost like landscape itself. And for me, landscape is psychological and has power. I suppose I sent you the picture with the catalog because the series of posts associated with it are among my favorites. I hope this answers that question, and, and I look forward to more. Bye. Hi, Geoff. I finally had time to read your post, and it's great. And while reading it, I had the idea to send you back some pictures of mine that I thought would be a nice counterpart to yours. Because both series of pictures seem to be related in a way, although the approach is pretty different. So it might be interesting to show them next to each other and discuss them. It's a few years ago that I started this series of photographs in foreign places that I visited only for a short time and that seemed culturally pretty different to my normal surrounding. But as I was a short time visitor, I thought about possibilities to get closer to these unknown cities without sticking to the touristic gaze, which is often very restricted. So I decided to hire an agent which would know the city very well, but which would not be aware of taking pictures while walking through the city. So the final decision was to use stray dogs as the cameraman, because in both pit cities in which I realized this project, there are huge populations of stray dogs. One city was the Mongolian capital Ulaanbaatar, the other city was Oaxaca in Mexico. So the cameras were mounted on the necks of the stray dogs and they took photographs automatically every 90 seconds. And the series of photographs which result documents the unique perspective of an animal as it wanders through the city. So the physical presence of the dog can be sensed in all the pictures. Sometimes hair is seen or the ground, often the ground, because the dog is sniffing. And because this series is determined by the seeming incalculability of a dog's perception, it's devoid of any aesthetic pretension or intended composition. It rather seeks to find a direct approach to a place which we would otherwise be incapable of realizing. So in a way it's almost the opposite approach to yours, which is more related to a personal view onto a known ground and reflecting memories in the past through photographing it. But in my case it's the attempt to get closer to an unknown place by trying to achieve almost unconscious photographs. But there are many pictures of the ground, as in your series, which is a nice relation. Hope to hear soon from you and bye bye. Dear Christian, as I navigate my neighborhood 
walking and reading these lines, I become more and more aware of how sound travels through the city. An annoying and fretful sound from one street bounces off the face of a building and follows me as I walk along a perpendicular road. Um, I can't seem to get away from it. However, pushing forward. I read about this stray dog project of yours some time ago, and I really love it. It's so funny. I had no idea that you are the artist behind this clever idea. I really identify with those photos. They feel as though filled with purpose, but not an identifiable one. Of course, once I read the procedure, I can tell myself a story about them. But still, the way you have chosen to focus my attention is so indirect. Hmm. I am not implicated in the looking by my own, nor by your choices. Do you feel that you got closer to these unknown places through these means? What did you learn about Oaxaca and Ulaanbaatar? It seems to me that your lack of intent in the making of these in the making of these getting lost pictures might allow you to view them without seeing yourself. Choosing places, and in the case of photography, choosing when to strike, makes it difficult to see without also recalling the moment of choice. Is this what you were trying to avoid? Having just written this makes me think how very autobiographical my own pictures of the ground might be. Eek! It is all about me, as some therapists would have it. P.S. My own looking at the ground originally was an attempt at deflection. Like you with the dogs, I too was looking for unknown places. My reasons involved safety and comfort. Why did you seek these unconscious pictures of unknown places? Until the next time, Christian. Bye. Dear Geoff, thank you so much for your letter. And let me try to answer some of your questions. So basically I'm very interested in how we approach places. Like what does it mean to be in a certain place at a certain moment? And how do we recognize that we are here and not there? We are continually occupied with actualizing and synchronizing our relation to the surrounding present, but we learn how to adopt to these situations. And we establish systems or modes in which we learn to filter out most of the perceptions in order to gain control over the overloading reality that we face. So here, by using the dog as an agent, I can make a step away from myself and from my habits and from my restrictions and from my borders of imagination and from my fear to go to specific places, etc., etc. Of course, it's still me that puts the whole thing into action, but after that, my influence is gone. So, to answer your question, yes. I was trying to get away from these decisions, like where to make a photograph and of what and when, because taking pictures of places also creates this distance between oneself and the place. Or at least I experience it that way. So in that sense it brought me closer to the place because I had to look at it from a totally different perspective. It's also about challenging the idea of travel photography and all the history that's connected with it. Like to travel to a place and then take pictures and then bring them home and give other people an impression of how it is there. It's such a subjective endeavor with all the restrictions that are related to it because the photo photographer is in a place that he or she doesn't even really know well so how could I avoid that and still make pictures? And why not being helped by someone or a dog who knows the place well but makes no choices that are related to the photographs? I mean of course there are decisions made like how often would the camera make pictures or where would I mount it on the dog or which dog do I choose, etc. But in that sense I think these photos are maybe just as much about me as yours are about you. But in a different way, of course. Yours are personal in a very direct sense. You often put your legs or your shoes in the pictures, as if to say, here I am, connected to that specific crown. But funnily, parts of the dog are to be seen in my pictures also, very often. His fur or his legs. So as I was speaking a lot about decisions and avoiding them, how do you decide for these pictures? Is it spontaneous or is it really looked for? And do you look through the camera or do you just shoot from the hand without framing? I think it's interesting that we both were attempting to get a different view onto a place, but in your case, contrary to mine, onto a city that you know very well, that is familiar. 
So how personal is your relation to this specific ground? Does it evoke memories of your past? Do you look for traces of history on the ground? Or for manifestations of subjects that inhabit the places? I'm happy to hear from you soon and bye. Hello again, Christian. Your lack of choosing drew me to the agent dog photos when I first saw them. Given my voracious attitude about picking up influences, they may have helped me understand how not to make perfect pictures. You are correct that my photo project is quite personal. Paying attention to the streets, sidewalks, and the ground in Los Angeles has been a part of my life much longer than I've been making photographs. And although the practice has evolved, it began as a strategy to deal with shame, and shame remains a force on it still. This shame comes from a variety of possible human sources sexual activity, unwanted attention, etc. Before I bought a camera, when I felt a flash of shame, I would look at the ground to deflect or avert it. This would dis distract the shame's focus from me, as well as distract me from feeling ashamed. Wow, helicopter, constant. Thanks, buddy. Just go away. Early on, I found myself making aesthetic judgments of what I saw. I would pick up an interesting piece of metal or wood, a rock or broken glass or plastic. It is important to me that these objects lacked an imposed narrative. They seemed free from the intent of others. Underline that sentence. And just as I was grateful to find safety in the emptiness they offered, I thought that these interesting objects might appreciate me paying them attention. Now I have a camera, and I'm more, more evolved than I was 20 or 30 years ago. I take photographs to explore and celebrate that past. I'm kind of laughing because I still have shame to deal with, and, as in the past, I look at the ground. In that moment, I will find abstractions in the cracks, angles, and differences in surface texture. It seems that we are both working outside of choice. You are choosing not to choose, whereas I am driven by need. You write about being and recognition in relation to place, and later you offer that you can see from a totally different perspective. What do you notice when you look at the dog pictures? What does this perspective teach you? It seems to me that we both are getting away from photographing identifiable places, and instead we give to viewers a sort of pregnant anonymity in the photos, meaning that in my photos there is a gesture toward abstraction and a serious consideration of plainness and of anti-glamour, a purposeful consideration of these things. In your dog photos, from my initial experience with them, I feel there is present some other intelligence. Something or someone is certainly taking the picture, but the criteria for choosing is not of my understanding. Sincerely yours, Jeff. Bye. Dear Jeff, you say that the choices are not of your understanding, and you're right. But maybe in this series of pictures, and maybe also in yours, it's not so much about understanding, but more about empathy. Because it's interesting that in both series, the photographer's body is not absent from the images like in most other photographs. And in your case, having parts of your body in the image works almost like a grounding of yourself in the image, or like a direct linking of your body in the ground and the image of it. And in my case, the pictures imply a bodily presence of something other than human. That's why I like your term, pregnant anonymity, so much. Because for me it implies an anonymous place. It's been loaded with something that is accessible for the spectator only by empathy for the person or the being behind the camera. But there's a difference, of course, for a human to feel empathy with another human or with a non-human other. So how deep can we actually feel empathy with a dog? Of course, the dog's world presents a challenge to me, as I am not capable of perceiving the environment totally in the same manner as the dog does. So, in this sense, I'm here also confronted with the limitations of my seeing. I think in this work both the body through which the world opens up to us and the world that is seen are strange. Maybe that was what I was fascinated by. Like, that these pictures ease me towards a situation or a suspense where what becomes visible is not me, but my seeing, my own voyeurism, and my curiosity to see what I cannot see, which also includes seeing myself seeing. 
It's interesting to read that shame was the factor that drew your attention to the ground. I know similar experiences from my life, but I would rather describe it as an inattentive attention, like a sub subconscious attention almost. I look at the ground, but I don't really look attentively because my thoughts are still occupied with dealing with this moment of shame. But you describe it totally differently. Like the attention for some details on the ground take away your attention from the shame. So what made you photograph it later on? Was it having time to investigate the spots more intensely when being back home? Or is it more like the wish to share these spots and these moments with other people? All the best. Take care, Christian. Dear Christian, yes, empathy. Even as I strive toward understanding, I rely upon empathy to light my way. I began taking these pictures because I had a camera, which I hadn't in the past. This is what I told myself. Reflecting on the photographs that resulted, I found an emotional connection that I hadn't expected. I recalled the first time I allowed my body to also be pictured, and it was a revelation. There I was. I cannot be denied that I was present. Then I felt empathy for the stuff on the sidewalk looking all forlorn, as well as for the earlier me who had depended so openly on these non-spaces for protection. Investigate, yes, of course, and also share. I hesitate to admit that my feeling of not being seen in that distant past makes me want to share my presence now. This hesitation of mine may be a reflex that I shall discard, time will tell. Your statement, what becomes visible is not me, but my seeing, is beautiful, Christian. Good Lord, that is a wonderful way to phrase a thought. And with that, I leave you once again. Sincerely yours, Jeff.